You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host, author, and occasional misanthrope, Juliet Miranda. Go to theunwritablerant.com and you can subscribe on iTunes or connect with the show on Facebook and Twitter. Hey there, y'all. This is Juliette Miranda. Welcome to episode number 70 of the Unwritable Rant podcast. Happy holidays, y'all. I think the only fitting thing for us to do right now is to fill up our glasses with a little bit of festive spirit, raise them up, and say cheers. Whew. All right. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I have an incredibly surprising bourbon in my glass today. I'm drinking Yellowstone Select Bourbon Whiskey. And I say it's surprising because this is actually a blended whiskey, and that's something I'm usually a little bit skeptical of because you're never entirely sure what you're going to get. You don't know the age of it. You don't know how well it's going to sit. But I got to say, this Yellowstone is perfection. It's this incredible blend of sweet and smoky and delicious. You know, you take that first sip and it's got a very sort of basic flavor. You know, it's a little bit of leather, a little bit of citrus, but then... When it opens up, there is the most incredible cherry flavor. Then as you roll it around in your mouth, it's got a really smooth, easy to drink sort of mouth feel. Bring it on down and it kind of rounds out into a little bit of brown sugar. It is the perfect holiday whiskey to drink. And it's only fitting seeing as how, of course, today is Christmas. Now, my guy and I are off celebrating with our families, but I didn't want to leave y'all hanging. So I have pulled out two of my very favorite stories from the archives. And both of them demonstrate the magic, if you will, of the holiday season and the power of writing letters. It's a skill I learned at a very early age because, of course, I grew up in the 80s and our biggest thrill in life was contacting other kids our own age from schools across the country. This first story is a little bit different than that. It takes place during the holiday season of my preteen years and involves me at my very most awkward and uncomfortable phase of my life. But somebody made a difference in it and became a very unlikely pen pal. And definitely stick around for the second story because, y'all, this may be the greatest Christmas tale ever told. But first, kick back and hear about who may be my very favorite pen pal ever. Now, I don't know how many of you were familiar with magazines like Teen Beat or Heartthrob, you know, all of the little preteen, you know, celebrity magazines. I adored them. You know, I was like 11 and 12 years old and these things were my life. And I actually read them for the articles. That's how much I enjoyed these things. And it's so weird. I mean, I had to have been about 11 years old and I had the biggest thing for John Stamos. You know, it wasn't full house time yet. So he was still doing kind of his random, uh, you know, stop and start acting gigs. And I think he was in a TV show called something like You Again. I think it was You Again. And I didn't really watch the TV show that much, but I loved his pictures in my magazines. I had a couple of them up on my wall, uh, you know, next to Michael J. Fox and everything. And me, you know, being the industrious little letter writer that I was, I sent him a letter. Uh, I cannot believe I did this. You know, I I was kind of an awkward 11-year-old. You know, I, I definitely hadn't grown into myself quite yet. You know, I was very tall, you know, really oddly skinny, and I, you know, didn't know what to do with my hair, so it just kind of hung there. And I was just, I was awkward and, and still trying to figure out who I was. I mean, that's just, you know, the plight of every preteen girl on the planet. And I had read this interview with John Stamos. It was one of those, you know, kind of puff pieces on him, but he said something that kind of resonated with me. You know, he had talked about, you know, growing up as a kid and everything and how he was kind of picked on. And how it affected him a lot. And he made this commitment, you know, as he got older and started, you know, being an actor and developing his career, he promised himself that he would never make fun of somebody for being different. So I'm reading this right. You know, my, you know, awkward little me eating Doritos and, you know, hoping against all hopes that one day I will be pretty. And here John Stamos is saying, you know, it's okay to be different. And I'm definitely not going to pick on you for it. And I saw this and I'm like, oh, I mean, I, I just it. It made my heart beat so quickly. Oh, my God. I just fell in love all over again. So I picked up my notebook, (laughs) my my pencil with the heart shape on the end of it, and I wrote him a little letter. And I poured out my little teenage heart. I did. I told him everything that made me sad and 
you know, how much I appreciated his words and that, you know, it meant so much to me to know that somebody like him would accept people for being different. And I thought it was just the greatest thing. So, you know, I signed my name. I put a little heart over the eye, mail it off to him. And I kind of forgot about it. So, you know, one day my mother goes out to the mailbox. She finds a letter for me. It's got a handwritten uh, address on it. And there's a postmark on it from Studio City, California. And she hands it to me. Now, my mother hadn't opened it, of course, but, you know, she was very curious about what it was because she knew that I was a little letter writer. And I think she was kind of afraid that someday I would get lured into a correspondence with, you know, a prison inmate or you know, maybe Charles Manson or something. You know, but that happened a little bit later on. You know, that was, you know, teenage years. <laughs> you know, but as a burgeoning preteen, you know, I stuck to love letters, right? So she wants to know who it's from. And I, I didn't know because there wasn't a return address on it. So I open it up, and it is, in fact, a handwritten letter written out to me, and it was a response to my note. I, it pretty much just said, you know what, Juliet, it's not easy, but one of these days, you know, you're, you're going to grow up and you're going to be thankful for who you are. It's totally okay to be different. You know, you just keep being you, and, uh, you know, good luck and thanks for your support. And it was signed, John Stamos. Oh, wow. I was... I was both mortified and thrilled, right? And my mother was blown away. Now, looking back on it, of course, I'm sure it wasn't really from John Stamos. I'm sure there was some little PR chick, you know, opening up his fan mail. And, you know, my, my note struck a chord with her. So she penned off a letter and signed John's name to it. I'm sure that's what happened. But at 11 years old, you know, seeing a letter to me from John Stamos, well, it just made my day. I mean, I carried that thing around with me for weeks on end. But here's the thing. I didn't actually show it to anybody because, like I said, I was kind of mortified because he had, you know, responded to some very personal things that I had written. And I didn't want people to know, of course, that, you know, I felt like a, you know, bumbling idiot half the time. So it was just my little secret. You know, me and John Stamos and our little pen pal ship. <laughs> And you know what? It's so weird because if I ever saw him, if I ever, you know, meet John Stamos, the first thing I'm going to say to him is, thank you for writing me back. And he's going to look at me like I'm absolutely crazy and I'm going to have to tell him the story. And again, he will think I'm absolutely nuts, but that's okay because it's little things like that that just, you know, make the difference. I swear to God, it was the coolest thing. Now, that may not have been a response from Santa Claus, but I got to say, hearing back from John Stamos or somebody pretending to be John Stamos was definitely the highlight of my preteen years. Sometimes it's just that little bit of extra thought that makes all the difference in the world. And that's why I love this second story so much. It certainly doesn't have the same, oh, I don't know, feel good sort of tone to it. At least, not in any sort of upstanding sort of way. But it does demonstrate how a couple of very carefully chosen words can make all the difference in the world. Y'all kick back because this, this is true holiday magic right here. The story of the Christmas shrew. So y'all, with all the shopping I did and everything, I got great gifts, but none of them really compare to the gift that I gave seven years ago. It is quite possibly the greatest gift that I have ever given. If y'all want to grab yourself a stool and sit around the uh, quite literal campfire here, I will tell you the legend of the greatest present ever given. So like I said, it was about seven years ago or so, and my guy and I were very early on in our relationship. We'd recently moved in together, and we were sharing a one-bedroom apartment. The apartment that we were sharing was really just a, a temporary holding spot for us because we were waiting for our townhouse to be ready for us to move into. So we were in kind of an odd little complex of units. And the particular unit that we were in uh, was four apartments. So there would be two on the ground floor and then two on the second floor. And the day that we were moving in, we met one of our neighbors and I knew right away that we were not going to get along. You know, as women, we can kind of sniff each other out. You know, we know at first glance whether or not we're, you know, compatible as, you know, women in general. And even if this woman hadn't come pounding on our front door to tell us that we were moving in too loudly, I would have known just on sight. I mean, she was just this this little angry elf of a woman. I mean, very, she was shaped kind of like a fire hydrant 
And she had this crunchy blonde hair that was piled on top of her head. You know, and she would be wearing stiletto heels in the middle of winter on icy sidewalks in order to make herself look taller. And she really just looked kind of crazy. So, you know, we're moving in, right? And she comes up to me and she's like, you guys really need to be more quiet because you're disturbing everybody in the building, you know, with your boxes and your moving. And I want to make a good impression, right? You know, I don't want to get off on the wrong foot. So I apologize. And I say, I'm so sorry. You know, we're moving in ourselves. We're just we're trying to, you know, do what we can to minimize the noise. I promise we'll we'll do our best. And she's like, well, you better. And then she stomps off to her apartment. And uh, I think, oh, Lord, this is going to be a problem. And unfortunately, I was absolutely right. I mean, she started off, you know, within the first week of just being the most obnoxious woman on the planet. You know, every time my guy and I would settle down and like start watching a movie or every time we would have a conversation, she would start banging on her floor so that we would hear this massive echoing booming sound, you know, so she could alert us to the fact that we were being too noisy. And initially, you know, we thought, okay, maybe we are being loud. Uh, so we ultimately met the other people who lived in our unit and we asked them, are, are we loud? You know, are the walls really thin here? Are we disturbing you in any way? And they're like, no, you guys are the perfect neighbors. We don't even know you're there. So then it kind of dawns on us, okay, we've got a crazy lady living above us and this is just not going to end well. And of course, you know, it continues and it escalates. So she went from pounding on the ceiling to leaving us notes on her door. Uh, she'd either put them on little yellow sticky notes or she'd write us a big long letter, letting us know just how much we were disturbing her existence with, you know, our awful loud ruckus in the evenings. And it's not like we were doing anything that was all that crazy. You know, we weren't having band rehearsals in the living room. You know, I wasn't playing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre at midnight at full volume. We were just existing, uh, you know, and, and we were having conversations. We were talking and God forbid we would have sex because the second we started, like even like the, the hint of a moan, she would go out of her mind and just start stomping on the floor like like some sort of combat warrior. It was insane. And then her notes started getting really weird. Uh, she started, you know, writing that the sounds of our perverted lovemaking were were so disturbing to her personally that, you know, she wasn't able to sleep anymore and that, you know, she was getting ill because of us. You know, and at this point, I just had to roll my eyes. You know, I mean, we weren't being that loud. And even if we were, you know what, honey, deal with it. You know, you live in a stupid, small little complex. People live, they exist, get over it. But she just kept getting nastier. And every time I would see her in the parking lot or the hallways, she would just shoot me this this poisonous look like she just wanted me dead. Now, we knew we'd be moving out pretty soon, so we just kind of, we figured we'd deal with it. You know, we, we just went about our lives. We tried our best to ignore her. Uh, and we knew that, you know, in a couple of weeks, we'd be moving out anyway. But of course, things had to get worse. They always get worse, right? So it's Christmas Eve. And the night before, it had snowed. And it was the most perfect snow imaginable. This was like Norman Rockwell snow, six inches of perfect, pristine, fluffy white snow. And we were in this kind of remote area, so it's not like anybody had walked through there. So we had this whole big field behind us that was just beautiful. And even me, you know, somebody who hates the cold and who hates the snow like poison, you know, I'm like, baby, we got to go out and play in the snow. And of course, my guy agrees. So, you know, we bundle ourselves up and we run outside. And we're frolicking around like, you know, a couple of horny bunny rabbits. You know, this was early in our relationship, right? So, you know, we're still in that weird, playful stage where we're chasing each other around, you know, throwing snowballs at each other, you know, wrestling in the snow. And of course, we made a snowman. And this was the best snowman I've ever made in my entire life. I mean, this snow just rolled perfectly. So we were able to build a good five foot snowman, you know, three levels of snowballs, we gave him eyes, we gave him a nose, a scarf, arms, the works. He was the happiest goddamn snowman I've ever made. So my guy and I go back into our apartment and, you know, we dry off and we make ourselves some whiskey cider and we're about to snuggle up for the rest of the night and just watch Christmas movies. And I look outside the window, expecting to see Frosty, and all I see is Frosty's bottom snowball. Well, of course, I've got to drag my guy back outside to see what happened. I knew, of course, I knew exactly what had happened to Frosty because snowmen don't just fall over. It's not like it was windy outside. It's not like some animal ran up to him and knocked him over. 
And like I said, we're in a remote area, so there were no kids around. There were no teenagers messing with him. No, Frosty had been murdered. And of course, you know, we go out and you see two perfect handprints right in his center snowball. And his face had a footprint on it. Oh, man, I lost it. And as if I needed further confirmation, there's there's an additional set of footprints, right, leading from Frosty to the side entrance of the building where the woman would always come and go. And I knew. I knew she had done it, and I was fucking pissed. So I run back into the house, and I am pacing in our living room, and I'm stomping, and I'm cussing, and I am fucking furious. I mean, nobody murders a snowman in my town and gets away with it, right? And my guy and I, you know, we're still early on, so he's seeing my crazy coming out for the first time. And, you know, he's he's watching my eyeballs circle like a cartoon cat, and he's starting to panic a little bit, and he's trying to talk me off my ledge. He's like, come on, you just, you gotta chill out, Hemingway, just simmer down. You know, let it go. It's Christmas Eve. You know, it's just a snowman. This isn't a big deal. But it was a big deal. You know, this woman had gone out of her way to try and disrupt our lives simply because she didn't like us. You know, so for all these months that she had been stomping on the ceiling and everything, this was just like the final, the final move that just, you know, put me over the edge. But I know myself, you know, I I can sure talk a good game, but I'm not a fighter. You know, I don't do confrontations well. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to just go up and pound on her door and call her out for it. And God, I could just see her sitting up there, you know, watching us in the window, you know, and, and, and just waiting for her moment to go out there and knock over the snowman because she was so enraged by us. So I had to do something right. And I know there is one thing that I do very well, and that one thing would be writing. You know, I have written dozens of letters to all sorts of corporations, you know, to complain about service. And I've gotten, you know, lots of really, really nice thank yous and, and you know, corrections and free gifts because of them. So I knew I could write her something that would that would just press the right buttons. But I also wanted it to be a little bit merry, too, because, you know, I'm not all mean, right? You know, I can be snarky, but I've got a little bit of a, you know, a softer side, too. So I wanted to give her a gift. So I found a uh, Christmas card. I wrote her a little message and I taped it to her mailbox. And God damn it, I wish I could have been there on Christmas morning when she went out and uh, saw that she had a letter there and opened it up and read what it is that I wrote, which was, we're moving in two weeks. Merry Christmas, you stumpy shrew. Oh, it would have been beautiful just to see her get so furious at that. I'm so sorry I missed it. Oh, but it was beautiful. It was so beautiful. And I felt so good about it. I really did. Because, you know, it was Merry Christmas and fuck you. Well, I hope these stories put a little bit of extra cheer in your cups. I know right now me and my Yellowstone bourbon are having quite the delicious time. So again, I hope you all have a very happy holiday. Thanks for listening. And don't forget, if you are lonely and in need of a drinking buddy, just look me up at theunwritablerant.com. All the back episodes of this podcast are there for your listening enjoyment. Or you can find me on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. I am always happy to chat there. With that, I'm going to do a little bit more celebrating, a little bit more bourbon drinking, and I hope all of you are having a fabulous holiday. Well, I will be back next Sunday with more stories and more booze. So until then, cheers, y'all. Girl, you as pretty as a Sunday morning, standing on the corner at Carondelet. What you say we make our way up to bourbon Couple hurricanes and a hand grenade And get blown away And let the chips fall where they may If it's all the same What you say, bon ton, lay Hey, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You 